so ubiquitous is the red-blue color scheme in today's US political discourse that many assume such a system has been around as long as we have had Republicans and Democrats. In fact, the opposite is true. The dichotomy is relatively young, having only become settled with the presidential election of 2000. In order to make political reporting more interesting and to help viewers more easily discern the leanings of a particular party, colors are often assigned according to the party's ideology. Black. Because of its association with Mussolini's black shirts, as well as Hitler's SS, internationally, black typically designates a fascist or anarchic party. In the 1960s and 70s in the US, however, the socialist Black Panther Party, BPP, adopted black for its color. Blue. Unlike in the USA, conservative parties internationally are typically identified with blue. This tradition is reputed to have begun in Great Britain, where the Tories adopted blue as their color circa 1900 in response to Labour's use of red. Green. In the Muslim world, because green was supposedly Muhammad's favorite color, it is frequently adopted by Islamist political parties. Hamas, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the Islamic Republic of Iran all use green on their flags. In other places, particularly Western Europe and the Americas, green is used to designate environmental parties such as the Green Party of the United States. Red. As with blue, the rest of the world typically uses red to designate a more liberal, left-leaning party, including everything from progressive and pro-labor parties to socialists and communists. This tradition apparently began with the French Revolution of 1848, when a red flag was used to represent the blood of angry workers. This brings us to party color in the United States. Before the year 2000, consistent with international usage, conservative groups in the United States were affiliated with blue and left-leaning groups were designated red. So well accepted were these denominations that following the Bolshevik Russian Revolution of 1917 and then again during the 1950s when Senator Joseph McCarthy conducted a witch hunt against supposed American communists, these events were known as the first and second Red Scare, times when the right were scared out of their wits according to two-time Pulitzer Prize winner Walter Lippmann, who incidentally was the first to outline the concept of the Cold War, as well as introduced the modern and psychological definition of stereotype, which previous to his usage was primarily a printing press term for a duplicating printing plate the more you know. Red remains a pejorative in American political discourse through much of the 20th century because of its association with communism, and neither party would voluntarily associate with it. As NBC's Chuck Todd said, For years, both parties would do red and blue maps, but they always made the other guys red. During the Cold War, who wanted to be red? Things began to change when the ability of news outlets to display graphical information leapt forward in the 1970s. When reporting the results of the presidential election of 1976, Time magazine's electoral map designated states won by Republican Gerald Ford as white and those won by Democrat Jimmy Carter as red. However, for the next election in 1980, Time's editors had switched the colors such that the states won by the Democratic incumbent were white and those won by Republican Ronald Reagan were red, presumably the more vibrant color was intended to identify the winner of the election rather than its ideology. For its coverage of the 1980 presidential election, NBC's broadcast included an electoral map that designated states carried by the Republican candidate as blue and those won by the Democrat as red. Anchor David Brinkley described Reagan's landslide victory of that year by referencing the graphic. It's beginning to look like a suburban swimming pool. NBC maintained these colors for the presidential parties until the presidential election of 2000. The other networks forged their own paths when covering presidential elections. In 1976, ABC used blue for states won by the Democratic candidate and yellow for the Republican, but by 1984 it had switched the Republican color to red. CBS designated Democratic wins with red and Republican with blue in 1980, but then flipped them in 1984. As vice presidential candidate for the Democratic Party, Geraldine Ferraro described the reporting of the 1984 election. One network map of the United States was entirely blue for the Republicans. On another network, the color motive was a blanket of red. This all brings us to the 2000 presidential election. Like the 2012 contest, the country was nearly evenly divided in the popular vote, and prognosticators were all over the map with their predictions. Political coverage leading up to the election dominated both broadcast and cable news. By this election, NBC had settled on blue to represent states won by Democrats, and red to designate those won by the Republicans. Tim Russett, the popular and respected moderator of Meet the Press, regularly appeared on NBC's then-top-rated Today Show to analyze 
publicize the contest. It is rumored that he coined the terms red state and blue state on its October 30th broadcast. Coverage continued unabated through the election on November 7th, and that's when things got really interesting. The race was too close to call, particularly in Florida. The Sunshine State's 25 electoral votes would put either candidate over the 270 threshold needed to win the presidency. Because the candidates were separated by merely 900 votes on the first count, a mandatory recount was ordered, which became the hand count in four counties. While people obsessed over hanging shads, the electoral system, and Catherine Harris, television broadcasters repeated the red state, blue state mantra ad nauseum. By the time the Supreme Court crowned George W. Bush the 43rd President of the United States on the 12th of December 2000, thousands in Bush and Gore, the dichotomy was ingrained in the American psyche. Today, if a reporter uses any other color scheme to describe the electoral landscape of the U.S., it is considered a grievous error. As one journalist for Slate, who purposefully reversed the colors and had to correct his story, put it, I didn't realize it had become so official. I must have missed the memo. And now for a bonus fact. Ever wonder how the donkey and elephant came to represent Republicans and Democrats? Well, wonder no more. The 1828 presidential election between Republican, not to be confused with the modern Republican Party, which was formed a few decades later, John Quincy Adams, and Democrat Andrew Jackson, is still considered one of the dirtiest campaigns ever run in American politics. Jackson and his supporters called Adams corrupt, spoiled, and a libertine, someone who lacked moral restraint, usually in reference to sexual matters. Adams supporters attacked Jackson Jackson's military record, his violent temper, his disrespect for authority, and most unfairly, his wife for marrying Jackson before she was properly divorced. Earlier, Jackson killed a man for issuing the same insult. They also called Jackson a jackass, comparing him to a stubborn, dumb donkey. Jackson was famously known as a populist, and his slogan, Let the People Rule, reinforced this. Republicans claimed that if the people ruled, it would be a bunch of jackasses ruling the country. Andrew Jackson, the savvy politician he was, turned the jackass into a positive symbol. He pointed out the virtues of being a jackass in campaign addresses, persistence, loyalty, and the ability to carry a heavy load. It also symbolized humble origins and simplistic virtues and owed to the common man. This helped Jackson further differentiate himself from the aristocratic Adams. Jackson wanted to be the president of choice for everyday citizens. He soon put the donkey on his campaign posters and referenced it in speeches. Jackson continued to be associated with a donkey even after his presidency, when an 1837 political cartoon depicted him attempting to lead a donkey who refused to follow. This was to show that the Democratic Party, the donkey, would not be led by the previous president, Jackson. From here, the donkey only made rare appearances as the symbol for Democrats until later in the century. The elephant, as the Republican symbol, now referring to the modern Republican Party, first made an appearance during the 1864 presidential election in a pro-Lincoln newspaper Father Abraham. Really, this was more political propaganda than newspaper, though of course the same could be said for a large percentage of news outlets throughout history and even today when it comes to politics. Father Abraham depicted an elephant carrying a banner and celebrating Union victories in the war. At the time, the well-known slang phrase, seeing the elephant, meant to engage in combat. So how did these two animals go from here to popularly representing the Democrats and the Republicans? This is thanks to famed political cartoonist Thomas Nast. Nast started becoming famous with the onset of the Civil War in 1861. He was working for Harper's Weekly at the time and illustrated over 55 engravings of battles and war scenes. In December of 1862, Nast debuted his version of Santa Claus, the jolly old fat man in a red suit that we now know today. Prior to Nast's depiction of Saint Nick, he was always shown as more of a religious figure and much less jolly. Later, in the political arena, he called out Boss Tweed's political machine, helped get Ulysses Grant elected president, and brought to light the savagery of the Ku Klux Klan's campaigns against African Americans. He also, as mentioned, popularized the donkey as the symbol for the Democrats and the elephant as the Republican symbol. In a cartoon called A Live Jackass Kicking a Dead Lion that ran in an 1870 issue of Harper's Weekly, he used the donkey to represent the Copperhead Democrats, a faction of Northern Democrats that were in opposition to the Civil War. In it, a donkey is kicking a dead lion who was a stand-in for the recently deceased Secretary of War, Edwin M. Stanton. Nast thought Copperhead Democrats were anti-union and believed the press's treatment of Stanton to be disrespectful. In 1871, the Republican elephant made another appearance, this time in a Nast cartoon in Harper's Weekly, to remind Republicans that their intra-party fighting could cause them to lose the election. The 1874 cartoon, entitled Third Term Panic, really solidified the symbolism for both 
animals. Ulysses S. Grant, whom Nast was a supporter and good friend of, had been president for two terms, elected in 1868 and again in 1872, and was contemplating a run for a third term. It wouldn't be until 1951 and the 22nd Amendment that a term limit was placed on the presidency, thanks in no small part to FDR's four-term run as president. The New York Herald very much opposed Grant's potential run and wrote several articles complaining of Caesarism, meaning military or imperial dictatorship. In Third Term Panic, it shows a donkey wearing the skin of a lion with Caesarism emblazoned on it, scaring off other animals, including a wobbly, unbalanced elephant, labeled as the Republican vote, about to fall into a pit, labeled inflation and chaos. Though Grant didn't end up running, Nast's cartoon didn't do enough to prevent the Herald Caesarism claims from working. The Republicans ended up losing control of the House in the election, and Nast showed his disappointment with another cartoon in November of that year, an elephant caught in a trap that was set by a donkey. Thanks to Nast, by 1880, the donkey and the elephant became the accepted symbols used by other political cartoonists and writers for the two political parties, and the association has stuck around ever since. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.